Stay tuned for tonight's adventure with the Fat Man. Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day it is, I hope it's good to be where you are because I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Baltimore Fats, and this is After the Flood. Yeah, okay. Have fun, guys. All right, so we're just going to start with where we left off, right? And that's envisioning Baltimore today if it were flooded, right? What that would look like. And it would fill in just as it did, just as it did in the floods of the 1800s. It would fill in this Jones Falls basin here, but it would cover all of this of what is Little Italy and Harbor East and Fells Point, you know, areas of South Baltimore over here, you know, and, and thinking that it's been a while since Baltimore has had a major flood, it's 1985, you know, and that's almost 40 years, and tying these floods to a possible solar cycle and seeing that we're in a grand minimum now and not really having a good understanding as to whether or not Roland Park Dam has been re-fortified uh, or reinforced at all in the last, you know, 160 years. <laughs> all right, and finding this web page did not help at all, right? It is the National Weather Service, right? And this is a web page that they have about the Baltimore, Washington area flood timeline, right? And so when we scroll down, right, it starts, you know, in 1748. And this is the timeline as they have it laid out, right? The first recorded flood in the region which is in Harper's Ferry. And now I don't know when Harper's Ferry was settled at all or anything like that, but first recorded in the region, 1748. There have been settlers in Maryland <laughs> since at least 1600. <laughs> hey, so we're talking 150 years here. And where do people first settle? But of course, along river basins and things like this, you know, they, there would have had to have been a flood and, and for there not to, and they wrote everything down, these people apparently. <laughs> right? So how is there no recorded flood before 1748 in this region, you know, I don't know. All right, but the next up on the National Weather Service flood timeline of the Baltimore, Washington area is, is when George Washington can't cross the Potomac, right? He was working as a land surveyor in 1748 and the flood was so great that he couldn't get across, right? Gotta mention George Washington in there. All right, and they have 1843, year of the floods. <laughs> right now, I don't know about you, but something is missing here. There's two Baltimore floods missing in there, <laughs> maybe even three, because the Baltimore Sun reports one in 17, 1786 for the first Jones Fall, but we have at least the 1817, 1837 on record by, seven, by 1843, the year of the floods, right? And these floods, it's the Potomac, right? Floods three times, right? No mention of any Baltimore flood yet. <laughs> We got April 52, the Northeast floods, the Harper's Ferry again, right? And here they have the first recorded flood of Jones Falls, May 11th, 1860. Now we know that this is not true. <laughs> we know that Jones Falls by 1860 had flooded at least four times right? since 1786. So in just under a hundred years. So, you know, you're talking an average of every like 26 years or something. Something like that. Jones Falls is flooded. First recorded, this is the National Weather Service. You know, what is going on here? <laughs> right? So they, okay, and not to mention that, it, this 1861 isn't mentioned anywhere in these other Baltimore flood articles I've been looking at. <laughs> Absolutely astounding. Here they have the first recorded flood of Ellicott City, July 1868. Now this is the same date as it happens in Baltimore. But here it's just Jones Falls and Baltimore also flooded. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, and then it goes on with the rest of the region and their floods. You know, mostly the Potomac here, it's looking like. You know, the Great Flood of 1889. And now this is absolutely amazing, right? Which is the Johnstown Flood in Pennsylvania. Now, during the Jubilee, at one of the exhibitions at one of the electric parks, was a recreation of this, jo <laughs> of this Johnstown Flood which is absolutely incredible because Baltimore City had experienced three major floods. <laughs> they couldn't recreate their own flood. Was that just too close to home? <laughs> you know, let's recreate this flood from Pennsylvania <laughs> instead. <laughs> uh, <it's> unbelievable. <laughs> right, in 96, and now we're kind of I'm just getting away. But there's just, it's absolutely incredible that there just seems to... <laughs> They've just kind of buried a couple of major Baltimore floods in this timeline from the National Weather Service. And thinking now that it's been a while since Baltimore has had a flood, 
You know, I don't know. <laughs> Could this stuff all just be some wacky coincidence? <laughs> and so, you know, so as was explored in the last episode, that 1886 flood was a doozy. Right? And so I found this other article on it by the Baltimore Police Historical Society, the disaster known as Baltimore's Black Friday flood. Right? And I'm not going to go too deep into this article, but there, you know, because there's so much that uh, Jacob Frey covered and we already talked about in the last episode, but there are some things I do want to point out. All right. And first off, this is the, um, this is the merchant building that in the 1868 flood that they say where all the debris kind of gathered and created like a dam around it, protecting it. Right. And so that area on the map is here. All right. This is the uh, Maryland Institute, right? And this is where all the debris washed in, in and shielding the Institute from major damage. All right. So I have a picture of the uh, Institute here. All right. And I'm not sure what year this picture was taken. Right. So, but just to demonstrate it, right, for that illustration, right, the water level is about this high. But when you zoom in on this picture, right, you can see that there are two people standing here. And so if you put those people, you know, we'll just say an average of five, five for the day, right? And, you know, they have to stack up about four times. So this is like a 20 foot height here. And so when you look at that illustration, right, and how high this is, this is a 20 foot, this is like a 20 foot flood zone here, right? Now, I assume this artist is drawing this from eyewitness accounts, <laughs> right? But they, uh, they show, you know, this is the type of rowboats they would go out in and try to rescue people and salvage things. And, you know, in, in this 1868 one, you know, as in the others as well, you know, it was a major torrent. These were, these were big floods. And I'm not exactly sure for how long a period of time the flood water stayed at such a high level. Like, was there a period of, how long a period of calm was at this height before they receded? It, it wasn't too long, certainly by the end of a day or something like that. But some of the descriptions of what's going on, <laughs> you know, just, you know, you know, really sort of beggar belief to borrow the term, <laughs> right? But one thing I want to do is I want to talk about this Maryland Institute real quick, because it's kind of an important building. And it's one that actually ties these Baltimore flood stories to Edgar Allan Poe, in a manner of speaking, which is unbelievable. And also to this idea that I've been exploring this whole time of, the use of popular literature and magazines and art, you know, as a subtle form of population control, you know, as such psychological warfare, right? Because what the Maryland Institute is, right, today it's the Maryland Institute College of Art, right? But it wasn't always that, right? Right. It started as the Maryland Institute for the Promotion of the Mechanic Arts, founded by these guys here. But most importantly to me and to this story is this John H. B. Latrobe, because he's the guy who gives Edgar Allan Poe his first big break by buying that story and having it win that prize. You know, and it's interesting, of course, no coincidence that that was decided right on Cathedral Hill across the street from the Basilica. <laughs> right. And, you know, so what it is, is it's kind of like a, um, an arts and engineering school. Right. And so it's established in 1826 and it kind of bounces around Baltimore for a while and it's first real home for a decade gets uh, burned down in a fire, <laughs> as these buildings tend to do, right? And it was caused by a bank riot during, during the financial panic. All right, so in 1851, the Institute moved into its own building, built above the old center market on Marketplace, known in the city as Marsh Market, after the, form in, after the former Harrison's Marsh from colonial time, right? The building covered an entire block and had two stories built on a series of brick arches above the market with two clock towers at each end. The second floor with the Institute housed classrooms, offices, shops, and studios, and one of the largest assembly halls auditorium in the state. All right, so now that's this building here. One of the largest editor auditoriums in the state and lecture halls, offices, classrooms, everything going on in this building here. And in the map, you know, here it is. You know, clock tower on each end here. You know, a long warehouse type brick structure. It's really amazing the part that it plays in all of these floods, or at least two of the floods. <laughs> all right, so it's in the 1850s here that that institute also has a school of chemistry, right? It gets a school of music as well, thanks to George Peabody, right? And his Peabody Institute and the Peabody Library, right? The B&L Railroad president chips in, 
They have architecture and engineering classes at night. And in 1854, they open a day school of design for women, right? The first U.S. arts programs for women, one of the first U.S. arts programs for women, you know, even before this day school for men. And in 1870, it becomes co-ed, you know, kind of progressive there, right? <laughs> Right? And it stays there for 79 years, and this is it. It gets burned down in the fire. That's all that's left of it. You know, it played its part, and they sacrificed it up to the Great Apollyon in the Baltimore Fire of 1904. But it says that the Great Hall here, again, amazing, was enough to accommodate 6,000 people. Right? And then it had the both uh, political conventions there, you know, in which Franklin Pierce ended up becoming the 14th president. It was an armory during the Civil War, right? President... Lincoln addresses the soldiers, you know, really kind of an important historic place. Okay, so now having gone through all of that, there are a few stories that I would like to go into from this uh, Baltimore police article here uh, from the 1868 flood, right? 50 lives were lost, 2,000 homes and property damage to be in the area of two to three million dollars, right? Some 4,000 people were thrown out of work by this flood. Right, and I like how they get poetic here. Wagneresque lightning tore the skies. <laughs> Barrages of thunder echoed throughout the city, and the and the and the downpour continued. But when the wind came in, that's when the crisis began, and that the stream rose to five feet in ten minutes, and and eventually reached a height of twenty feet. You know, as would have been that mark on the Institute building. All right, talk about all the bridges getting washed out, as all as happens in all of these floods. All right, the rats. <laughs> they talk about the rats. Driven from their normal from their normal births by rising water, fled in terror through the streets. <laughs> the water gets into the Sun Iron Building on East Baltimore Street, right, threatening the building and its equipment as basement pumps fail to keep pace with the onrush of water. And I think it's interesting that the Baltimore Iron Sun Building had pumps in the basement, as, I, as if almost they were prepared for some sort of flood. <laughs> it was only the intervention of a fire department pumper that saved the building and allowed the paper to publish the next day's newspaper. Thank God for that, man. With all these major flood disasters, they have their lighter moments as men and women revealed in semi-nudity, <laughs> catching waifs and strays, you know, flour and whiskey floating down. <laughs> yeah, there was a slight disruption of the railroad service, but the waters receded quickly as they had raced through the city. And by nightfall, looters were breaking into empty stores, homes and warehouses and taking what they wanted, unchallenged by any authority. Of course, there had to be looting going on, right? All right, the mud was six to eight inches deep across the sea. That is some deep mud, deep, deep mud. <laughs> and as a 94-year-old survivor of that flood, Miss Josephine McPhail, she recalls in 1937, I can still see in my mind's eye the color of that raging torrent, the mad rush of debris, and the rats. Above all, the rats. <laughs> Her most lasting impression, her biggest terror of the whole thing was the rats just trying to get out. <laughs> right, but the story I want to tell is about this James Carr here. You know, he's a brave, he's brand new commissioner, newly elected. All right, and this flood happens and he gets in a boat. You know, he's going around and he's rescuing people from houses that are just getting torn and, and, and carried down Baltimore streets here. All these neighborhoods down here are just gushes of flowing water, you know, anywhere from four to 20 feet high, right? And catching on buildings and all these houses flying down and everything, all right? And so he gets in a rowboat and he's trying to save people. What happens is, is there's some sort of collision and his oars fall in the water and he tries to reach in and grab them. But in doing so, like a, a wave comes in and is, tilts his boat and he falls in and he gets carried away by the tide and starts bouncing his way down uh, I think it's Harrison. And so another police officer falls in trying to catch him, right? And the three men float helplessly along the tide, right? And so the commissioner and this other officer go in the water. They're swept away. A shout at once went up that Commissioner Carr was drowned. It had been seen to disappear under the water, and everybody supposed his corpse would be found after the flood subsided. The evening commercial quickly published the rumor in an extra edition. <laughs> they, they had time to go run and publish an edition that the commissioner was swept away and drowned right? because only an hour later it was happily proved to be incorrect. <laughs> what is going on during this flood that they can <laughs> they can publish a special edition and an hour later the man is found alive, right? <laughs> For he was rescued at the corner of Fayette and Harrison Streets. All right, so the story of his rescue is as such, right? He's flowing down and 
right? He's bouncing around. He's trying to catch on things and hold on. And he goes down Fayette Street. Right? And among the onlookers is an expert swimmer who ties a rope around his waist and dives into the water. Right? And he swims out to the middle of the street. And he recognizes the commissioner, who at that time was almost exhausted. Right? After an hour's battle, he's bouncing around <laughs> downtown Baltimore for an hour in these floodwaters, right? Right. So after this hour's battle with the waves, the citizen made to him the odd fellow signal of distress. Right? So in the middle of all this, his rescuer goes out and shoots him a hand sign, a Freemasonic hand sign. That is unbelievable. <laughs> That is just a crazy story involving the police commissioner and his rescue during the 1868 flood. All right. And so now, since it seems that like the National Weather Authority doesn't really want us to know about this pattern of floods and seeing that it's been a while since Baltimore has had a major flood. And, <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to go back and take a look at the uh, Baltimore Sun articles about what was happening uh, during those floods. And so. Let's start with that. We'll go back to the first flood, which was the 1837 flood. And so I was a little disappointed because I found out that my eyes failed me and that I thought I actually had Sunday, that I thought I had June 15th, which would have been the day after the flood. This is the second day after the flood. So there may be like a wayside episode or something coming where I, you know, depending on what I find looking at the, uh, the day after the flood. And this is the, this is page two. They call it the dreadful inundation. And they started off, you know, as they do almost every article after these major floods, right? It has the same sort of lead in. They, they, they lead heavy on this, the storm that comes through and they, they paint a very, dare I say, romantic picture of what a massive thunderstorm and flood scenario would look like. Very disaster movie-ish. You know, and the story is the same as the others. All the bridges get washed away. You know, there's terrible damage. To the houses and and buildings are flooded all over the place, and I took note of this in here and that 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 Jones Falls like lower basin area there was at one time called the Meadows, right? You know, and that sort of plays into the forestry angle and the woodland mythology, you know, overtones or undertones, you know, all through the Mud City Paradigm Puzzle Tree these days, right? And again, here's a really tragic story of this priest, right? Who the the flood hit his house so hard, right, that he and his family were drowned and they were all holding each other. How much more tragic can you get than that? All right, so now this is the most interesting part of the 1837 flood for me. The basement stories of all the buildings in Harrison Street from Gay to Market were filled with water. And at the lower end of Harrison Street, some of the second stories were inundated. So now we're gonna switch up and we're gonna look at the 1822 map, right? So because for there to be basement buildings in 1837, it would stand to reason that they would have those same basement buildings in 1822, right? <laughs> and so here's the Jones Falls area here, right? Because now this is the city plan, right? That doesn't necessarily mean that these things weren't already there. And this plan is based on that, right? You know, certainly in this paradigm, that's what we're looking at. And that's how this is starting to get very mud floody here now with these basements and this time frame, because if they if they have basements this deep, especially along a riverbed like this, and one that they would have known had a tendency to flood, you know what you would need to do to build that, you know, to dig out that foundation. It would be like marsh, you know. The the um and these buildings are big, you know. Here's this is the building that becomes the Maryland Institute right here, right? I mean that these are six thousand people could fit in this, <laughs> and six thousand. You know, so imagine the type of work that would need the the earth that would need to be moved for the foundations for there to be basement levels to be flooded every 20 years or 40 years or whatever the cycle provides. So to me, that really suggests, you know, an older date for a lot of these buildings, you know, especially having the basements so close to the water, you know, and this all being like marshland and stuff like that. How is it that all of these buildings have basements? All right, really, really interesting, the flooding of all these basements in 1837. That's, that's a good year looking at the, uh, the mud flood timeline. And again, finding that the mud, you know, mud getting in the basement inches deep, six, eight inches deep mud in these basements. And so before moving on to the 1858 flood, I just want to say they, they sort of tal tally the damage at something like $2 million, which at that time would have been something like $50 million in today's money. 
But also I want to point out that in 1837 is the only time there's like real compassion in the reporting of these floods in the Baltimore Sun when they uh, publish this little editorial here. The munificent are now afforded an opportunity of exercising their charities. We learn that a large number of indigent and meritorious families lost their little all in the calamity of Wednesday night. They need the aid of the generous and the munificent. Let those who are able step forward at a time like the present and relieve the distresses of the distressed. The extension of a little charity may gladden many a sad heart and rescue the widow and the orphan from impending want. Let us all remember that it is said in the Book of Life that he who giveth to the poor loaneth to the Lord. Who will not gladly assist the unfortunate? And I love that they call it the Book of Life here and not the Bible or even the good book or just the book, the Book of Life. I like that. <laughs> right, again, major, major flood that the National Weather Authority just didn't, I don't think, seemed worth mentioning. <laughs> And so now for the 1858 flood, what I want to talk about is that this article is from the day after the flood. You know, it has that same sort of very dramatic, you know, lead in, but then it starts talking about the damages, right? And the thing about this article and the damages is it, it's so much like the, this, it's the exact same thing that they did after the fire, right? I mean, they had everything down and ready to go. All right here we go. They just start throwing names around and what they lost. You know, Johnson Tobacconist, he lost 500 bucks, which is you know, probably like 10 grand worth of product today. This guy lost $800. This guy $450. This business, you know, these homes, you know, the damage to them, this clothing store, you know, even like $25 damage to a shoe store, you know, $25, you know, that translates to like 650 bucks today. <laughs> <laughs> and they had, but they had it all ready to go. And they have all these people's names typeset the day after the flood. I mean, this thing took out that whole area. The sun building itself was flooded. You know, how did they get this information so fast? You know, one guy I wanted to mention, I love his name, the hardware store of Solomon J. Khan, <laughs> you know, King Solomon, right? He had the hardware store, you know, he was helping you build stuff. You know, but it's just, you know, absolutely incredible. They have everything. Everything is here. You know, how many men had to go out into the field and interview people, write stuff down, come back to a central office, work it all out with a guy who has to hand typeset this stuff right, for a daily newspaper? Again, it's just amazing that that National Weather Authority really downplaying these Baltimore floods has just really blown my mind. But there was w just a couple quick things in this one I wanted to touch on before I close out with the 1868 flood. All right, so, yeah, so this story is really amazing, right? All right, uh, the escape of a boy occurred at the tunnel across Bond Street. A youth named John Bryson, aged about 16 years, while endeavoring to catch a floating tub, fell in and was carried through the tunnel about 100 feet and was caught upon emerging below, having received no injury in his precious journey in the dark waters. A hundred foot tunnel on Bond Street. <laughs> I had to look at that. All right, and so here's Bond Street down by the Inner Harbor. So if there's a tunnel down here on Bond Street, that's a hundred feet long. You know, it's certainly not on this map of only seven years earlier, right? In this area that would have been flooded out. Right? Absolutely incredible. Now, there were just a couple of things that I thought were funny or interesting about the 1868 flood. You know, once again, you know, they just have so much <laughs> ready to go here. You know, talking about the losses and the companies that lost stuff. I mean, for the day after. This is, you know, talking about all the things that were destroyed right, in this uh, flood here. And I, I, I found this one, right? The Baltimore Special Dispensary. No, not the dispensary. <laughs> right? The apothecary shop, right? Entirely destroyed, you know, lost not being less than $400, which at the time is about 10 grand. And so in contrast to the apothecary, <laughs> right? Mr. Nicholas Majors, you know, his, he's a tobacco dealer, estimates his loss at five to 6,000 in leaf tobacco. His cellar is filled with mud and water, you know, with four feet on the first floor. 
you know, six thousand dollars. All right, so that's like a hundred and fifty thousand dollars in tobacco he's claiming. Right? And so to put that in some sort of perspective, at the average price of cigarettes today, I'm guessing, <laughs> is I'm gonna put it at eight dollars. That would be the equivalent of almost 19,000 packs of cigarettes, you know? And there are tobacco dealers on every corner. You know, how much tobacco do you need in your shop? And especially at this time in the uh, 1860s, Baltimore, I'm going to say 100,000, you know, I can't even remember off the top of my head. You know, it's not like, you know, people are lining up around the block to get tobacco from this guy. And you know, you would imagine that, you know, like a nickel would buy you five cigars or a pouch of hand rolling tobacco, right? $6,000, you know, $150,000 in tobacco claimed lost, you know? One of the things I wanted to point out, in, in so many cases, they talk about how little damage was done. And I don't know if it's in this one or the 1858 one. That was a kind of a point of interest too, that, you know, there was so much flooding Yet so little damage was done. You know, they just they had water six feet in their house, but little damage was done. <laughs> and so so many people had time to prepare. How did they have time to prepare for this? You know, interesting the way the story is played out in the Baltimore Sun of these floods and and the things that they reported. But I do want to put a little cherry on this one, this little mud flood two-parter. You know, and showing the relationship between you know real floods in Baltimore and a possible correlation to the solar cycles and things like that and what that could mean and tying that into the mud city paradigm puzzle tree All right and that is that they talk about all that mud on the floor you know four or six feet of mud on on floors and, and cellars and stuff like that and how all of these floods took place down here right and as i was mentioning that by that this, by this basin and where all the flooding is just as they show it in um you know in this modern rendering right this is this area here Right, all this is a hill and it steps down into this basin part, right? And so all these basement dwellings had, you know, feet of mud in them after these floods. But Mary and I, one day, we found mud on the top of the hill <laughs> in the most unexpected place. I, you, you couldn't ask for anything more. Now, this is something that I've had in my pocket for, you know, almost a year now, I'd imagine. You know, when I was first formulating the idea of, of Baal to Rome, which was going to be the sequel to Baal to Moore, right? And Mary and I went around and we actually went to the Basilica and we went inside and we went into the basement. <laughs> and so, all right, so I'm going to try to find those pictures right now. All right. And so one of our earlier excur one of our earliest excursions, Mary and I found ourselves at the Basilica. We walked right up and in and... Even though we weren't supposed to, we went right down into the basement catacombs. And all right, and so this is underneath the basilica. These are like the catacombs. There's apparently bodies buried back there somewhere. But what I really want to show is this. All right, so I'm wandering around down there and I'm taking these crazy pictures and I'm taking it all in. And there are people down there praying. And Mary and I are not supposed to be down there. <laughs> but she draws my attention to these series of pictures that are on that are on a side of one of the pillars down there, right? And this is an unbelievable series of photographs. She's like, look at this. Where do you think all this mud comes came from? Because look, these are the arches here, right? And this is what they are now. All right, all of this was buried deep in mud. And you look at this worker guy here in the center. You know, this was stuff that was done in the 1980s. And there was a big refurbishment and overhaul of the basilica. Now the basilica is at the top of the hill, at the top. <laughs> if there's mud this deep, if there's mud this deep in the in the basilica cat catacombs, how high did the Jones Falls really flood? <laughs> right. So all right. So all right. So I just want to thank Mary for making this little two parter possible, and making me get in touch with my mud flood roots <laughs> in this mud city paradigm puzzle tree. All right, that was a lot of fun, but when I get back to it, it's going to be all about Poe. All right, so just because you don't know the truth doesn't mean you can't have fun with the lie. Right, until the next one. Cheers, guys.